All right, welcome everybody to week seven, day one. This is a very, very important day. Today we are going to be learning about vectors, okay? So vectors are, um, you, you've already seen vectors. Um, strings are actually vectors. Uh, they are vectors of characters. Uh, they hold zero or more characters. That is a, that is a vector. Vectors are uh, a data structure uh, what does a data structure mean? A data structure is just something that holds lots of variables. Okay, and um, so a string. I think these are dominant strings, as you can tell from the colors on here. Um, strings hold zero or more characters, and that's that's what a vector is. A vector is something that holds zero or more of something, and vectors can be for integers, floats, doubles, strings, whatever. So you can hold zero or more of any data type you want. That's what a vector is. So let's go over, um, were there vectors in Maori? There were. And so what we've uh, kind of done this uh, this semester is we've sort of like tried to even out the, um, the learning curve for you guys so that you've worked with strings before. So you've seen like for loops to loop over a string, right? Where you can like um, do this, right? 4 int equals 0, i is less than s dot size, i plus plus, c out 2 upper s dot at. So you guys have seen this. This is the same code pattern we're, we're going to use for vectors because, as it turns out, strings are just vectors, basically, with a little bit of uh, sprinkled uh, goodness on top of them. For example, strings, you can concatenate strings by using the plus operator uh, somewhere on here, like right there, bob plus tim. Uh, you can you can concatenate two different strings together. You can't do that with a vector. So strings are basically vectors with a little bit of string magic added on top of it. And uh, and so the whole point of the setup that we've done for you is to kind of make it really easy for you guys to get into vectors. So if you want to get the size of a string, by the way, there's two different options for it. There's dot size and dot length. They're exactly the same as far as I can tell. And if you want to grab individual characters out of a string, use dot at. So bar dot at five out of nyan space cat is going to give you which letter. So uh, if we can get some audience participation here. Nyan in is index zero. One, two, three, four, and five is cat. Very good. And then what happens if we try accessing element 50,000? Uh, Nyan cat has a total of what eight characters in it. What if, what happens if we try doing dot at fifty thousand? Has anyone here experienced this yet? Experienced what happens when you um, uh, go out of bounds? No, you're out of bounds. Um, it <laughs> kills the program. Okay, and it it kills it though. It kills it though nicely. And this is actually really important because we're going to be talking about arrays a little bit later on. And so if you have a string, so string um, l equals hello world. If you try, uh, let's put the semicolon there. Okay. Uh, if you try outputting hell dot at two, what letter is this going to print? What do you guys think? L? Which L? The first L or this? <laughs> it is in fact L. It is not E. In C++, we start counting from zero, okay? In math, we start counting from one. In C++, in computer science in general, except for Fortran, uh, we start counting at index zero. And there's some other languages that don't count at zero either, but all the good ones uh, start counting at index zero. So H is zero, E is one, the first L is index two, and this is gonna print out L as a result. Now, if we were to print out 50,000 here, then uh, you will see that we get a crash, but this is a good crash. It, it, it's a helpful crash. It tells us what we did wrong, which is really nice because with an array, it won't. And arrays, arrays are basically, uh, um, well, I, I don't want to spoil my rant on that, but they're, they're terrible. Why is this good? Because it tells you what you did wrong. You do not want doing what arrays do, which is just to print out whatever is there in memory, right? So if you, if you have 10 elements in your string, you try printing out element 11 with an array, it'll just print whatever is in RAM there. Or even worse, if you write to it, you're now overwriting whatever is in RAM there. That's really bad. When you use dot at, it detects the error, kills your program. 
you actually want your program to die. You do not want it corrupting memory ever. It is that is one of the worst bugs. It's the most annoying to track down. It takes forever. Um, it causes your program to behave unpredictably when you're randomly corrupting bits of memory. Uh, you want this. This is actually really, really good. Um, and it tells you. It tells you you tried accessing uh, element 50,000, but the size of uh, Hello World is 13 characters, so you can't. That's that's bad. It kills your program. This is actually really nice. This is this is wonderful. Uh, okay. And uh, if you if you ever see people use square brackets, um, square brackets are like dot at, but they do not do bounds checking. And so if you do this, just hey, tell me what's at there. Look, this is what's in RAM there. A checkered, a checkerboard pattern is in RAM at uh, whatever ASCII code that corresponds to was in RAM at that memory address. We just printed out something random in RAM. Hope you know that wasn't your password, your credit card number. Uh, and even worse, if we write to it, I hope that wasn't like the return address for a function because that'll cause a crash, et cetera, et cetera. You guys understand? In this class, I never want to see you guys use square brackets, ever. OK? Uh, the square brackets, the only advantage a square bracket has over dot at is that it doesn't check boundaries. Wait, isn't that a good thing? Yes, it is. That's why you should not use them. Okay, always use dot at because it will check your boundaries. So when is that a benefit? When is it a benefit to not check your boundaries? Anyone know? When when you'd want this? Anyone? Yeah, there are no benefits to this. This this is accessing bad memory. You want to be told you're you're going out of bounds. Trust me on this. Now, in general, some people will argue for square brackets because it's faster. In CSI 40, you do not care about speed. None of your homework assignments in this class are going to require you to hit a speed target. Okay, later on, as you move, and when you <laughs> yeah, when you want to make ASCII art, where you're printing out the contents of RAM, right? Do you guys want to see this? Like we can do this. Okay, so for anti equals zero, uh, i is less than 100, i plus plus, uh, c out, hell, square bracket, i, yeah, let's just print out RAM, let's find out, let's find out what happens, right, there you go, this is an exciting use for it, you should not do this ever, by the way, there you go, so that's what's in RAM, bruh, almost, very close to saying bruh, square, checker checkerboard, blah, glib, glib, c plus plus, Hello world is there. Okay. So you're just printing out contents of RAM. Okay. And maybe that's interesting, but no, no, don't ever do this. In this class, I do not want to see you guys using square brackets ever. CSI 41, if I give you an assignment where it's like, you know, performance actually matters, then sure, by that point, maybe it's okay. I never want to see it in this class. Okay. In this class, you should always use dot at. And if you try going out of bounds, it kills your program. Okay, and that's good. You access element 13, which is greater than or equal to the size of it, so it kills your program. This is good. Okay. Now, um, uh, yeah. So this code here is going to say this is a this is a pattern that we've been using for strings. It's the same pattern we're going to be using for vectors. For anti equals zero, i is less than s dot size or s dot length. Same thing. Uh, i plus plus. Uh, so that says starting at index zero, going through the end of the string, print, in this case, the uppercase version of every character in the string. So that's going to print out mace windu uppercase. How do you do this in Unicode? Nobody knows. <laughs> in all seriousness, um, there is uh, there are libraries that, that can handle this kind of stuff in Unicode. It's a far more complicated. It's a far more complicated question in Unicode than just calling two upper. Because it's like, sometimes uh, the uppercase version of a letter is two letters. So it gets really complicated in Unicode. In ASCII though, keeps things nice and simple. Okay, and you guys remember range-based for loops. For every character in the string, print out the uppercase version of that character. Okay. So vectors, boom, here we go. So, uh, bro, why are you printing out RAM? <laughs> uh, so vectors are useful anytime you want to avoid having to make large numbers of variables. Um, I might make like up to like three, like if I have integer x, integer y, integer z, 
I might I might type it out. I probably would type it out. That seems that seems like something I'd type out, right? I might go int x y z. I might do that, right? Anything more than that, though, you're going to see me make a vector, okay? And so if you're doing like a tic tac toe grid where you've got like nine spots on the grid, I am not making nine different variables. I'm sorry, that ain't nobody got time for that, okay? Today. So what we want to do is we want to make a vector, okay? And so this is how you make a vector. Uh, you say vector, and you have to hashtag include vector in order to get access to them. Uh, you say vector, angle bracket, whatever type of thing you want to make a, a vector of. It's like a vector of integers would be vector angle bracket int. If you want to make a vector of doubles, if you're holding, if you want to hold 100 doubles, you'd write this line here, except change int to double. Um, vec is the name of the vector. Uh, do you have to name your vector vec? No. Uh, in the previous class, I played uh, airplane. Uh, Roger, Roger, what's your vector vector? Do we have clearance, clearance, that 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 whole thing? Uh, could this theoretically be used in square fill to keep track of grid cells they've been drawn to? In fact, the color grid in inside of square fill is a two-dimensional vector. So it's already actually done for you. So you can actually read and write to the colors in the 2D grid to see if some something's been written there already. Uh, vectors, though, are one-dimensional. That's actually what a vector means. It's a one-dimensional um, set of numbers that holds zero or more numbers. And so in this case, in this place, in this case, we are making a vector that is holding 100 integers. The name of the vector is vec. And yeah. So how do we access individual elements from the vector like this? So vector dot at zero equals 42. Uh, so we've essentially created 100 integers all in all in one go, and all of them get initialized to zero. That's also important. Vectors initialize vectors default initialize all of their all of their members. So all the integers are initialized to zero. It's nice. Um, and then you, this is how you access individual elements of the vector. So you've just made 100 different integers and you can use them separately however you want. All right. And uh, so let me uh, maybe sketch this out in one note and we'll see if we can get some audience participation here. So, do, 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 do. Looks like conspiracy theory stuff, huh? Vectors. Okay. So, uh, if I want to make a vector of doubles, let's say, of size four, how do I do that? Post on chat. How do I how do I make a vector a vector of doubles of size four, and we'll name it. How do we do that? Post it on chat, please. Make a vector of doubles of size four. Let's see if you guys can remember the previous slide, short-term memory. So it's gonna be vector, good. Angle bracket, double. The name of the vector, which I guess we'll call vec. And if you want size four, you need to put a four there, not a three. Now, good. Now the indices will range from zero to three. Okay. So the inde the index, the indices start at zero and they go up to three. If you have size four, zero to three is the range. Okay. So how do I write a line of code that sets this element to 60? How do I do that? How do I write it? How do I write a line of code that will set um, the first element of the vector named vec to 60 using dot at, not square brackets. Square brackets are the devil. Do not use square brackets in this class. So the vector, you guys remember how to use dot at? Dot at, index zero the value is set to 60. So this is the index here. And this is the value that we're setting it to. All right. So afterwards, after this line of code runs, then this guy's going to be set to 60. OK, so uh, Vanessa, are you here? Let's call on random people that are not participating. Vanessa, are you here? 
All right, give me code that will set this element to 32. I'm gonna put a 32 into element one right there. Because this vector is essentially four different, it's four different doubles, right? Actually, uh, 32.1, it's a double. It's not, we don't have to use integers here. 32.1, how do I put 32.1 into index one in the vector? How do I, how do I write that code, Vanessa? How do I put a 32.1 into index one. Thank you, Liam. <laughs> very good, very good. Round of applause, everybody. 32.1, excellent. All right, clap emoji, please. And after that line of code runs, we now have a 32.1 into here. All right, Gunnar Lamar, the Jeffest of all Jeffs. How do I put the biggest integer possible into here? How do I put like the biggest integer possible into slot two? Hmm. Vector dot at something equals something. How do I do this? How do I put, it's gonna be like 2 billion-ish, right? How do I, how do I do this? How do I, how do I put the maximum integer value into slot two? Hmm, vector dot at two is correct. Uh, equals int max. And in order to get access to that, you have to hashtag include C limits. And then you can say something like scout and max. Let's get rid of this abomination. Okay. And there you go, 2.1 billion and change. When I took this class, I actually had to memorize those numbers. It was kind of ridiculous. I'll just be like, I'm just gonna use Max. Like, if I ever actually need to know the number, I will just Google it. I don't need to memorize it. I got better things to do with my uh, hard drive up here. You know what I mean? Okay, so, cool, cool, cool. Excellent, so that that will work, int max. And I always get that backwards with max int. I always guess one and just see which one shows up on autocomplete. So that'll put 2.1 billion and change into here. Okay, and then uh, Liam, how do I put uh, pi into vector dot at three? I'm gonna put pi into here. I'll spoil that part. How do I put pi into here? Hmm. Yeah, three point one four one five dot dot dot. How do I do that? Hmm. Hmm. M underscore pi. Very good, Olson. That is the uh, that is the correct answer. So Liam, too slow on the draw, I guess. And uh, it is not declared in C limits. It is in C math. And there you go. So this is the math underscore pi symbol. So you don't have to make your own pi. You can use pi that somebody else made for you. So m pi. And as you guys can see, you can just set all the set all the elements in a vector to different values. So if we do this in code over here, vector of doubles and vector of size four. And we can even we can even do it like this, where we can do 60, 32.1, int max and m pi, this would actually work, I believe, although it's gonna be mad, I think, at, sorry, somebody's at the front door, uh, brb. Okay, I'm back. So uh, the reason why it's upset here is because, uh, this this uh, error message isn't very helpful, by the way, because um, if you wanna specify all the elements of a vector, then you can't give the size. So if you do that, then it works fine. 
So uh, either give the size, in which case it initializes everything to zero, or give a uh, braced initialization list like this, which will um, initialize all the elements. In fact, you don't even need the uh, equal sign. You can actually just do it like that, A OK. And it will create a vector of size 4 with the first element equal to 60. So if I were to see out vec dot at 0, what is this going to print to the screen? Never discuss cheese with rats. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting uh, photographs in chat while I was gone. <laughs> How do I print out element? Is, like, what is that going to print? Okay. Sixty. Very good. And now I could print out the whole vector like this, right? What do you guys think? Is this is this the uh, is this the correct way to print out a um, a vector? Copy paste, increment the number each time. Is this how you should be printing out a list? For loop, a for loop. I got six students submitting code like this. Actually, seven. Sorry, for the uh, for the bridges assignment that we did on Friday, where uh, they hand coded a checkerboard pattern onto the screen. Um, that is, yeah, it's it's more effort and it's also less good coding wise, right? Because if you miss something, it's like, like, do you see like which numbers are missing here? Like, I don't. Uh, in fact, I think this is actually probably wrong because it's the same color for both. I don't know, I actually have no idea. Uh, so yeah, it's like impossible. It's impossible to debug this, right? Like, now maybe it's okay, I don't know. But don't do this. Like this, like anytime you see yourself copying and pasting code and like changing a number, that's a sign that you should be whatever that number is that's incrementing each time, like this number right here in the middle here, that's a sign you should be using a for loop. Okay. And so I could replace this with a for int i equals zero, i is less than vector dot size, i plus plus. Does this look like a string for loop to you? It should. It's exactly the same code out vector dot at i and this will print all the elements it does this essentially so this for loop here generates this code for you without you having to copy and paste things a billion times okay <laughs> right if only there's an easier way of doing it is even right this is this is definitely a meme uh <laughs> um yeah, the, the whole is even thing is a definite uh, programmer meme. So, and then is odd is de defined as not is even, right? Um, so anytime you find yourself writing code like this, where there's like one number that's going up each time, uh, that's a sign it should be replaced with a for loop, okay? Now there's another way we can do a for loop here. Anyone remember how? Here is option one, option uno. This is a traditional for loop. Anyone remember the other way of doing a for loop? A range, a based for loop, exactly. Range based for loop. And it would look like this. For every double x inside of vec, see out that double. Now, uh, some people use i here. I don't like using i here because to me, i, like mentally, i means index. Right, and there's two very different things. There is the index, which is the slot number of the uh, of the slots in the vector, and then you have here oh, on the charging thing again, and then over here you've got the value, right, that is held at that slot. You guys see the difference here? So when you do a range-based for loop, the first time through x is sixty, then it's thirty-two, then it's two point one billion. With a range-based for loop, you get the values. With a regular for loop, you get the indices. The indices go from zero to less than size. With a range-based for loop, you get 60, 32.1. Do you guys understand the difference? So the regular for loop iterates across these things. The range-based for loop iterates across these things. And they are not the same, and do not confuse them. Because if you confuse them, all hell will break loose. Um, the, let, let me, okay. Let me preface this by saying never, ever, ever do this. Don't write this down. Don't even... Don't even pay any attention to what I'm about to show you. 
Don't let it stick in your memory. What I'm about to show you is excessively bad. This is a this is a bug, and I'm gonna let me put no. Okay. No, 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 no. Don't do this. Don't do this. And a lot of students have trouble understanding like why this is bad. Isn't it the same thing as this? What is X the first time through the loop here? All right? If we were to see out X the first time through the loop, what number are we gonna get? Sixty. Right? This is gonna print sixty. So what is in slot sixty? How many slots do we have in the vector? What's the size of our vector? Four. What is in slot sixty? Something in RAM. Yeah. But we're not using square brackets. If we were using square brackets, this would be even worse. Okay? This is uh, going to crash, okay? And so if we compile the code and run it, you'll see the first, the first for loop works fine, right? It prints out 60, 32.1, max int, pi. And then we start going through the second loop. It prints out 60 because we have that range of for loop uh, print in there. And then it tries accessing element 60. Do not confuse the index. These guys do not confuse the index with the values. Okay, if you try accessing index 60, you are gonna have a bad time. If you try accessing index negative 42, you will have a bad time. These are like pi, like what is even index pi? Well, I guess it's three, right? And, and that might actually not even crash it and might even give you the right number, which is even more terrifying, right? Because pi actually happens to be in slot three. So it actually print the correct thing in that case, which would even confuse you even more. Okay. Do you guys understand why this is bad? Don't, you know, if you're sticking to this pattern, traditional for loops, you have an index and you use dot at that's peanut butter and chocolate. And it goes together in the traditional for loop because with a traditional for loop, you're saying index zero, index one, index two, index three, and dot at tells you what is at index zero at index one at index two not index 60, not index 32.1, not index 22.1 billion, right? Like do not confuse. This is the value at each spot. This is the index at each spot in the array. Do not get them confused. This is a very, very big no. And a lot of students make this mistake. Okay. All right, so good. Now everything's fine. So you can either do it this way or you do it this way. And this is one of the reasons why I do not use either. If I use i, mentally I think index, and then I would go vector dot at i, right? Because what's at index two? What's at index three? What's at index four? Hmm. X to me means a value, like some value, right? And so, you know, like an algebra, right? X, find X, there it is, it's right there. <laughs> uh, uh, right, there it is. Okay, um, so it's the value, right? And so here it'll print all the values. These two for loops are exactly the same. All right, so moving on with our slideshow, I want everybody to repeat after me. How do you make a vector? All right, everybody on chat, everybody type vector. Just vector and hit return. Open angle bracket. Gonna, you have to memorize this, okay? To grind it into your memory. Vectors are one of the most useful things you will ever learn in computer science. Trust me on this. CSI 41, you're gonna learn uh, all sorts of data structures. None of them get used as much as vectors do. Okay? Type. This is the type of value that we're gonna be storing in the vector. All of them must be the same type, okay? There's a very, uh, obscure advanced ways of making heterogeneous vectors that can hold different types. Don't worry about them. Just by default, 
all vectors contain one type. Yep. Close single bracket, or the greater than sign, as you will. Then the name of the vector. So just type name or something like that. Open parentheses. Size. And then close parentheses. And who did we forget? Our good friend, the semicolon. Semicolon. All right. That is how you make a vector. All right. So uh, for our lab time today, and we're not quite there yet, but I would like for you guys to mm, let's put on the chat. Here we go. Just a quick question. How do I make a vector of strings of size 2,000? So it can hold 2,000 strings. Type that on chat right now. And a string itself is kind of a vector, so you know it's kind of like a 2D vector, like a crossword puzzle almost. If you have a vector of strings, you could use that to create like a, a, a crossword for or a word search, or um, you could hold uh, like each string could be a paragraph of Hamlet, and so each string would be a paragraph, and you could like loop over all the strings and print out all of Hamlet in it. So how would I make a vector of strings of size 2,000? Um, why 2,000? There's probably not more than 2,000 paragraphs in Hamlet. How do you, maybe? Check. Word count. Bytes, characters, lines. Do we have paragraphs? Let me see. Uh, New line counts. I don't really have. Maybe it's kind of paragraphs. Okay. Let's find out. Word count by a line. Public. Shakespeare. Tragedies. Hamlet. 6,000 lines. So we might need, might need to up it. Okay. So it is, in fact, a vector of strings named Hamlet. I don't know. Size 2,000. Boom. There you go. Looks like you guys got that. Good. So this can hold 2,000 words. The string, remember, can actually be multiple words. Um, normally, we think of a string as holding one word. Like when you see in, it reads one word into a string. But uh, technically, a string can hold all of Hamlet. It could be in one string. Okay. So, All right. So that you guys got that. You guys got that. Good, good, good. OK. So let's move on with the presentation here. Good. The type name, the variable name, the vector size. These will change. Um, okay, so we make a vector of strings named Bob that holds 50 strings. Make a vector named Foo that holds integers of size 100,000. Make a vector of Booleans, which is one of these things that causes experienced C++ developers to curl into a ball and cry. <laughs> because a vector of Booleans does not actually create 32 Boolean variables. It creates an integer, maybe. So, uh... This is this is there's a giant asterisk on this one, so don't make don't make vectors of booleans. You will you will cause PTSD in experienced uh, C plus plus developers if you do so. Um, and then you can use them like this. Uh, so Bob dot at twelve equals Bob dot at eleven plus high. So that's going to concatenate string concatenation. It'll glue together the two strings of what's at uh, at eleven and high. They get merged together and saved into uh, Bob dot at twelve. As you can see here, basically each one of these elements of the vector are just variables. They're just variables that just work like any other variable. When you make a vector, though, it just allows you to spam create huge numbers of variables all at the same time, with a benefit that uh, you can just for loop over them, and you don't have to like say like x, y, z, w, v, u, t, and you like run out of letters and yeah, it's, forget about it. You know, like I said, I'll, I'll hand make up to like maybe three variables, X, Y, Z. And then after that, it's vector time. Okay. They're so real for that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically each one of these 
uh, elements of a vector is just a variable and you can just access them like this. That's the first one, foo.at0. It's being set to be the average of foo.at1 and foo.at2. Cool, all right. So in a loop, uh, this is the standard pattern and this is the same pattern for a for loop that we've done before. And so it's not a coincidence that the same for loop that we use for strings is the same for loop we learned when we learned for loops and it's the same for loop we use with vectors. There's a reason why I teach this pattern. It's because this pattern is the standard pattern in C++, okay? You might see other people start for, for loops at one, going for less than or equal, no. We do it this way for a reason, okay? It's called the half open code pattern and it is the standard in C++ and in most programming languages, okay? So this is how you iterate across a vector. So you say foreign type equals zero, i is less than scores dot size, it's gonna be 100. So foreign type equals zero, i is less than 100, i plus plus. This is the standard pattern that you do to iterate across a, a vector, okay? And now what are we doing here? Hmm. Scores dot at i equals 10 times i. Hmm. So the first time through the loop, i is zero, right? So the first time through the loop, i is zero. So we're saying scores dot at zero. So the first element in the scores, basically, I guess we're keeping track of like baseball scores or something like that. Uh, so the first element in the baseball scores vector is gonna be set to 10 times zero, which is zero. Next time through the loop, i is one. So scores dot at one, the second element is index one, uh, is gonna be set to 10. The next element's gonna be set to 20. The next element's gonna be set to 30. The next element's set to 40. So we're essentially creating like the tens times tables, right? So this scores vector has got a hundred elements in it, ranging from index zero to index 99. And each element is gonna have a value equal to 10 times its index. So index five is gonna hold 50, index 10 is gonna hold 100, et cetera, et cetera. You guys understand this pattern? Uh, typically what you'll see people do with things like this is they'll set scores get that at i to zero, like that's very common. Now you don't need to do that with a vector because it's already initialized to zero. But like if you wanna reset it, it's very common to have a for loop like this that just says scores that at i equals zero. And it just clears everything back out. You will see that all over the place in computer science, you know, clearing, clearing an array, clearing a vector to zero. Very common. Um, something else you might see is setting each element to a random value. Maybe we'll do that in lab time. In fact, right now, let's, yeah, let's do a little. Let's do a little quick question, right? A little quick question. So, how can I set each element in? Let's make this integers. Ten of them. How can I how can I set each element in vec to a random number from one to ten? So I'm going to pause the recording now. Uh, those of you watching along at home, pause and see if you can think about how can I use the code pattern here or the code pattern here. Now, if you're going to be Using the range based for loop, remember, remember to do call by reference. Uh, if you are, um, let's be in it. Um, if you are going to be changing the thing using range based for loop, you need to have the ampersand there. Okay, we don't for the C out because we're just printing it. But if you are going to be, um, if you are going to be editing it can't be const either, right? So if you try setting x equals five or something like that, can't do that, you gotta be called by reference. Okay, and this is gonna set, <laughs> set every element in vec to five. Pretty close, pretty close to our little mini lab time here. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute and see if you can come up with a answer using either the trad for loop or the range based for loop. Remember the ampersand if you're using range based for loop to set every element to a random number from one to 10. Plus. All right, so let me show you guys how to give the answer here. So let's 
set every element in vec to be a random value from one to 10. So we can use the traditional for loop here. I'll just copy and paste that and then say vector dot at i is going to rand modulus 10 plus one. Okay. And so the first time through the loop, i is zero. So vector dot at zero, the first slot is going to be set to a random number from one to 10. Next time through the loop, i is one. And then vector dot at one will be uh, set to a random number and so on and so forth. If you want to do this with a range based for loop, option one, option two. In fact, I can even just copy these uh, comments here. Uh, rather than scouting everything, we are going to just say x is equal to rand modulus 10 plus one. So I like range-based for loops better in situations like these where you're just like doing something on every element of the vector. And the reason for that is because uh, whenever you work with indices, there's always a chance, not for something like this, but there's always a chance for more complicated stuff that you're gonna go out of bounds. Like you're gonna, you're gonna like do, do something like this where you're like, oh, let's set the next guy over. And then if you do that, when you hit the, you know, you're going to go one past the end and you're going to go out of bounds and it's going to crash and you're going to be sad. So if you can, I would use a range based for loop. You don't have to. Uh, a lot of people prefer traditional for loops. That's OK. They're just alternatives. Options range based for loops, though, are safer because you can't go out of bounds. So um, both of these are equivalent. I have no personal preference, although I would probably write this code here. Uh, I honestly have written it both ways. It's it's fine either way. Okay. Um, if we were to run this, you'll see it prints out the random number is twice. So three eight one ten and three eight one ten. So yep. All right. So um, printing out a vector is something you're going to need to do. It's really easy to just knock out a little range based for loop like that. Um, so like that right there for every element in the vector, print out that element, you get real comfortable with that. Cause that's a real fast, real easy way of printing out your vector. And then that'll show you everything you have in the vector real fast and put it in, print it. You're like, oh, okay, that looks good. Delete it, whatever. Not a big deal. Doesn't that mean range based for loops are less capable? Yes, they are. Definitely. Like there are definitely times where like, if you want to do something like say, uh, set each element to the average of its two neighbors. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't do that with a range of base four. Uh, I mean, if you really like, you know, you made a variable holding the last iteration of the loops, like you could probably hack something together really gnarly, uh, with it. But yeah, in cases like that, where, where like the index matters, like, Hey, tell me who's to the right of me. Tell me who's to the left of me. You need the index for that. And so in those cases, you use a traditional for loop. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with a traditional for loop, uh, especially when the index matters. Like, print out what index I'm at. You know, that that's a thing, right? It's so, like it's pretty common um, to do this, where you print. Uh, you know, index 0 holds a value of 3. Index 1 holds a value of 8. Index 2 holds a value of 1. Right, you need you need to do a traditional for loop for that, right? You, you, you could hack it together with a range based for loop, like you could hack something together, you know, and i equals zero, and see how i and slap a little plus plus on there. You do that, and you can make it. You can make it. You can make it work. But at this point, like if you're doing all this stuff, like uh, just use use a traditional one. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. It's just for simple things, range based for loops. I like them because the less things that I I can uh, screw up on, the better, right? The simpler, the better. Right. So yeah, great, great point, Luke. They're they're definitely less powerful unless you do some horrible hackish things. In which case, just use the regular for loop anyway. Okay. Um,
every time you pass a vector to a function, it should be passed by reference. And there's basically two options only. Not call by value. You should pretty much never be passing a vector call by value unless you're really wanting to like just duplicate it because you're gonna be like modifying it and wanna throw the modifications away or something like that. Like it's extremely rare for me to find uh, my own code that has vectors that are called by um, that are called by value. So like if you have uh, void init vec, something like that, you're gonna see a vector of integers by reference in vec. And if we do something like for every value in vec, set that value to zero, this is gonna clear all the elements in vector to zero, okay? So if we do this, we just say clear uh, in this back like that. And so this is going to set all elements of vector zero. So if you're gonna be modifying the vector, you pass it in by reference. If you're not gonna be, um, if you're not gonna be modifying the vector, then you pass it in print vec, const reference, const vector of integers, by reference vec for integer x and vec, see out x. Yep. So now we've got a function to clear a vector, we've got a function to print all the elements in a vector. Print vec. Like that. So if you're going to be modifying it, you pass it in by reference. If you're not going to be modifying it, cost reference. Those are basically the only two options. Like I said, call by value is extremely rare. Just when you want to make a copy and change it and not keep it. You do that, you can see that we are now getting zeros everywhere. Okay. So this function here uh, clears the element, clear, clears all the elements of back. This one prints it. This one prints it. This one prints it. So we're printing it three times. Okay. I should probably toss these guys up into here like that. I'll just try. Um. You don't need to do it twice. And then, uh, or do you like rand vec. So if we want to uh, set all the elements in vec to a random number, then We don't need to do it twice also. So we can initialize it and print it, and then we can for x randomize it and print it. You can see we're clearing it and printing it, and then we're clearing it and printing it. Okay. Or not clearing and printing, sorry, randomizing it and printing it too. Okay. So does this make sense to you guys? Like basically we've got 10 integers here and we're just passing the vector to a function and then that passes all 10, it passes all 10 integers in, but it doesn't copy them uh, because we're not doing call by value. Call by value is really bad with a vector because a vector could have like a gigabyte of data in it. And then you, you know, you, you, you pass it in, it duplicates a gig of data and throws it away. It's incredibly slow and wasteful. So basically, uh, the rule is you're either going to pass a vector by reference like this, or you're going to pass it in by const reference if you're not modifying anything. And const reference will stop you from doing something by accident, like vector dot at i equals forty two. Like if you try changing it by accident, it will um, catch it. Right. So const is good for you. It'll stop you from accidentally doing something you weren't supposed to do. Okay, so what we're going to do now for lab time for the remainder of class, uh, unless you guys have any questions, let me make sure there's nothing left on here. Oh yeah, we need to talk about arrays. Yeah, yeah, we need to. Talk. You wouldn't copy a car. <laughs> Downloading is stealing. I remember that. Okay. Um, we do we do need to talk about arrays a little bit. Okay. So vectors are great. Vectors are life. 
uh, arrays are just um, the low skill version of I'm kidding. Um, arrays are just like the 1970s version of vectors. They they don't do bounce checking. Uh, they can't grow. We haven't learned how to grow vectors yet, but vectors can grow. Um, they're just they're just like vectors, but worse. There, there's very little reason to use an array. The only the only reason in CSI 40 in particular that you'd want to use an array is because you just don't want to type the extra eight letters for a vector. Uh, and which is I respect that, but like, come on, like. Yeah. So if you want to make a hundred uh, integers this way using a vector, you say vector of integers named foo size one hundred. Boom, hundred, hundred are made and initialized. With an array, they don't initialize them. So now you have 100 uninitialized variables. Um, there is uh, one simple trick that doctors hate if you are going to use an array like that. Integer r100 equals open close bracket. Uh, doesn't like it. Oh, no, it's simple. There we go. Okay. So if you, uh, if you initialize the array to uh, open close bracket like that, it sets all the values to zero. So that is a very simple way that you can actually clear all the elements in an array. Um, just a little pro tip there. That's modern C++ still, but makes arrays a little bit more palatable. Uh, so this makes 100 uh, no, square brackets instead of angle brackets. So it's making an array of size 100, and you access things in an array using square brackets instead of dot at. So dot at 12 allows you to go to index 12 and set the value there. Square bracket 12 allows you to index 12 and set the, the value there. They're, they're the same thing, except square brackets do not do bounce checking. And so uh, for a long time, like C programmers have said, oh, well, you know, just get better at programming. You know, don't go out of bounds. You should know better. And then, you know, somebody ran a, a tool on GCC. You know, these are the people telling you, like, it's a skill issue, right? And they ran a tool on GCC and found, like, 100,000 instances of undefined behavior. I think it's John Regwar at University of Utah did that and uh, basically found 100,000 instances, something like that, of GCC, the compiler, having undefined behavior uh, in it. And uh, the, the, the reality of the situation is like humans make mistakes. We, we all do. If you're bad, you make more mistakes. But if you're good, you still make mistakes. And you are going to go out of bounds at, at times. And um, you want your code to detect when you go out of bounds and kill your program and say, hey, you went out of bounds. You do not want it corrupting memory, right? If you if you do something like this and you say array 100 equals 42, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna get a warning here. This is valid C++. And in fact, if I see out array square bracket 100, I get 42, right? This code appears to work. That's what makes it so dangerous. You do not want code that appears to work, but is actually buggy. This is highly, highly dangerous. This is the kind of thing that causes experienced computer science people to wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night when they realize they went one too far outside of an array axis, right? If you, if you do this, um, your code might work for the next five years and then suddenly you know a new compiler comes along and happens to put in ram right next to r their the return address from the function and now your code seg faults you have no idea why you've got a million lines of code one place within your code you've got an out of bounds access with your square brackets you have no idea where right and and that these bugs like i've spent you know like my my bald patch up here is a result of me tearing my hair out uh, trying to track down these sorts of bugs. They're that annoying to track down. And so just take it from me, use dot at uh, and bounce check everything. There's now tools that will do uh, bounce checking for you at runtime at the cost of performance, but it's always good to at least run them at least a few times and make sure that you're staying within bounds at least in normal behavior. Because if you go out of bounds, oh Lord, oh Lord, it is, it is gnarly. I had I had a out of bounds error that uh, took me three months to track down or arguably it was, it was really like a week of full time 
It's like 40 hours of my life to track down one out of, out of bounds bug. It was not something I w- wish upon. Well, maybe upon my worst enemies. That seems fair. But like against like my friend of me is not, not at all. It's too much. <laughs> so, uh, were those billable hours? They were, I got paid. I got paid to write the bug and to fix the bug. So there is a, there's a pro tip, right? But if you look at the story of uh, Tim Kaine, he's the guy who invented Fallout. Basically, he's I, I love the guy. Uh, he's got really good um, videos on Fallout. Um, if you watch his story on why he left Fallout 2, this one right here, uh, he talks about an out of bounds error, and the uh, what happened was Fallout 2 was ready to ship, and um, it was crashing occasionally and, and sometimes it wouldn't crash at all. Sometimes it crashed instantly. Sometimes it crashed after 15 minutes and they couldn't like Tim Kane was like, no, uh, I do not want to ship this game while it's crashing. This is really bad. It'll make us look bad. People will never buy another black Isle studios, obsidian studios game again. And so the manager was like breathing down his neck and they were going line by line through the code, trying to find the place where they had an out of bounds error. And it actually ended up delaying Fallout 2 for months as they were very, like, like methodically going through the code. And they would, like, write zeros to a, a bunch of memory. And then they would run Fallout 2 for a while and then check it and see if that memory had been modified. And so by moving, like, the place where they put the zeros and where they checked for the zeros, by moving them around, they're able to isolate, okay, the bug is in this area of code here. And then they would, like, move it. Nope, it's not there. Okay, so it's got to be over here. And they they sat there and it took them months to do this very, very methodically narrowing in and narrowing in and narrowing in on the block of code. You could say it fell out that, uh, that had the, the out of bounds error on it. And this was the out of bounds error. That's it. Anyone see something wrong there? Hmm. Four months. And after it was over, like uh, the management didn't give Tim Kane his bonus that he was expecting. Like he was the guy, he was like Mr. Fallout, you know? And they they didn't give it to him to teach him a lesson about, uh, I don't know, like not delaying a game or something like that. Um, and so he quit. Like that's why he like left like Black Isle was because the manager was mad at him for delaying the game and he's like, it's crashing. You know? And it came down to a single off by one error that was going one too far and writing a writing to RAM one integer past the edge where it's supposed to be. And just every so often when you did this, it would delete something in RAM there that was actually really important and the code would crash. And it took them like months to find it. And so, yeah. And so the problem is it was, this is going to be accessing array element 100. Oops. You know, another way they could have done that was like that. Either way, one too far. And that was it. Four months of life. Uh, the, the inventor of Fallout leaving the company that made Fallout. Like, I mean, the, the you know, you, it's not a skill issue. You know, it's like people just make mistakes. And so this is one of the things that I try to, hammer on my students. On one side, you want to always follow the pattern, right? The half open code pattern. For int i equals zero, i is less than blah, i plus plus. Blah is the size of the array. Blah is the size of the vector, right? Just follow that pattern, you're good. You don't have any off by one errors. And then the other side of things is don't use square brackets. Use dot at. When you compile your code, if you use compile, Let's find out if this is actually going <laughs> to. What did it do? I don't know. It seems to work fine. Right? But there, there it was. Like we wrote to RAM past the edge of the array and we obliterated it. Hope that didn't have your bank account number. Hope it didn't have your phone number. Hope it didn't have your social security number in it because it's gone now. Okay? We just erased something, right? 
Now, if you compile main.cc, uh, you might notice something here. Easy peasy, which is a static analyzer I wrote, uh, notices that you went out of bounds here. Okay. And, uh, and it tells you, right, you're, you're going out of bounds. And so pay attention to that. Uh, it's actually, sorry, it's actually not my static analyzer. It is CPP check, which is Google static analyzer. And it tells you, you are going out of bounds here. Don't do that. Do not go out of bounds. Okay. Um, so pay attention to these things, you know, it's, it's really bad. And then if you run it, uh, you will notice, oh, this is a weird error here. Uh, that's different than when I compiled it directly, right? I use, I just use the compile. Right? I just use the compile um, command. I'm getting a very different uh, response now when I run it, right? Before it just ran, no problem. But now, oh, address sanitizer. Stack buffer overflow. Ba -ba 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 -bum. Okay. Main.cc line 42. No, you're out of bounds. Okay. Uh, and so if you come back in here and go to line 42, you can go to line 42 by the by the by by typing 42 shift G. That takes you to the line. That's the problem. Or you can vim plus 42. Either way, there we are. We're on line 42 now. That's where you went out of bounds. It tells you. This is something called address sanitizer. Address sanitizer is life. Okay. Address sanitizer tells you when you go out of bounds. And so uh, online 42 of main.cc, you went out of bounds. Don't do that. And it's got a bunch of stuff here that is just not especially helpful for new students that are probably scary to them. What you want to look for is this line right here. That's telling you where you went out of bounds. Okay. So runtime error. Index 100 is out of bounds. Okay. Boom. Fix it. <laughs> so address sanitizer will actually kill your program for you, which again is a good thing. You do not want your program running when it is going out of bounds. It is extremely, extremely lethal. It is one of the worst bugs in human history, <laughs> let's say. Like all these like hacks you see of like banks that are due to like stack overflow, you know, attacks and things like that, it's because people weren't bounce checking their arrays properly. And so long story short, don't use arrays. How about that? Is that short enough? Don't do this. You're going to see this. So I teach it enough that you understand what's being done here, right? This is making 100 integers. It's initializing them all to zero. You know, we're then going to set them all to 100 or something like that. Like, you need to be able to read this code. But whenever you write code, you should just use a vector. They're superior to arrays, especially in CSI 40. The only real benefit arrays have is they can have a speed benefit, which does not matter in CSI 40. Okay? Zybooks will teach you arrays. You will see Geek for Geeks of all places using arrays. Um, mm -mm, don't use them. Here's, here's what you should do with an array in your homework in C++. Use a vector instead. All right. So, uh, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, let's, that, that's, that's, that's all I want to say about, about arrays. Just don't use them. Okay. Now for lab time. What I'd like for you to do is the following. Bum, lab time. Make a vector of doubles of size six. Then uh, CN into the vector. Yeah, basically six times times for each element. So basically, you're going to read from the keyboard six times. You're just going to type, type in like 10.1, 20.2, 30.3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you are then going to print the vector out. Uh, if only there was code on the screen right now that might show you how to do that. Uh, print the vector out. Then the last thing I want is for you to print the minimum value, the maximum value, and the average value in the vector. 
See if, uh, see if you can figure out how to do that. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys half an hour. If you guys, uh, get this done, um, bonus, uh, figure out how to sort the vector, uh, using the sort function on CPP reference. Yep. Okay. So if you get, if you get one through four done, then sort the, uh, Sort the uh, vector before, uh, before three. Let's say. Okay, so I'm gonna pause it now. You guys got half an hour. See how much of these you can get done. I really hope all of you can at least get number one done, <laughs> and number three, because it's on the screen. <laughs> all right, I'll see you in half an hour. All right, and we are back. Let's do this. So everybody posts their code onto chat. We're going to make a vector of doubles of size six. So we're going to do this. And we're going to do this. CN into the vector six times, one for each one for each element. So we can do this a couple different ways. We can do the uh, traditional for loop way. CN into vector dot at i that six times it is going to read from the keyboard into the vector the first time it's going to read into vector dot at zero next time into vector dot at one etc etc or we can use a range based for loop but of course we have to use a all by reference parameter here a little less uh not an integer sorry double there we go I got over here. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, don't do this. No, 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 no. Don't. the the whole The whole point of a the whole point of a vector is to not have to write six variables, right? Like, uh, <laughs> it's the whole point is to not do it. So, so you have shattered into innumerable pieces. Okay. Um, so either way will work. Um, I guess I prefer the range-based method. I think I'll be we're almost done here. Um, it's a little less typing. So for every element of the vector, we're going to read it in. Uh, print the vector out. Um, okay. So before we do that, let me show you how to sort it because I'm going to sort it. Then I'm going to print it. What's up, bro? Uh, the burger is yours. Okay. Uh, so let me show you how to sort something. Sort vector dot begin vector dot end. Easy as that. CPP reference is where you can find things like that. And that will just sort them all smallest to biggest. Yep. Uh, and then we're going to print it. So I guess I'll delete this here and just keep this simple. simple solutions. This is number one. This is number two. This is number five. Okay, so now we're going to do number three, print the vector out. So for every double in the vector, see out the double, bullet point number three. Okay, now we're going to get to the tricky part. How do we print the minimum value, the maximum value, and the average value in the in the vector? Okay. Um, so it looks like some people had a decent solution here. So we're going to take the minimum and the maximum. If you ever find somebody smaller than the minimum, that's the new minimum. If you ever find somebody bigger than the uh, biggest one we've seen so far, then the biggest one we've seen so far is that person. So for every value X, you're going to print it. See if it's smaller than the smallest. If so, the smallest is that guy. If it's bigger than the biggest, the biggest is that guy. Add the sums together. And then to get the average, you add everybody together in a vector and divide by the size of the vector. Boom. This is a great implementation. But it's not the fastest implementation. As it turns out, there is a function that will tell you the smallest element of a vector. Don't have to do it yourself. Does that mean that there is one to tell you the biggest element of a vector? Why, yes, there is. This can all be found on. CPP reference as well. Okay. 
you could write it yourself. In fact, uh, the solution that we see here where uh, the student is adding together all the elements and then dividing by the size is chef's kiss. Perfect. This is what we want to see in this class, right? The only reason I'm showing you this is because one of the hardest things to know <clears throat> when you're a new programmer is what's been done before, right? What What's out there? Is there an average function? Um, I'm not aware of any, but there is one that will, uh, there is one that will add them all together. And so this function is called accumulate. Accumulate that. And it takes a third parameter, which is the starting number of zero. And accumulate requires us to hashtag include numeric. Thank you. Accumulate uh, the autocomplete filled in parentheses there. Okay. And so accumulate adds up all the elements of the vector, and then we're going to divide by the size of the vector like that, and we are done. So three lines of code to do minimum value, maximum value, and average value. Boom, ba -doo, boom, boom, boom. Compile, run it 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It sorts it. Well, it's already sorted. We'll put those in a different order 60, 20, 10, 30, 40, 50. So it sorts them, puts them in order, and then tells you the minimum value, the maximum value, and the average value. Done. Okay. So that is, uh, that is class for today. So vectors are legitimately, um, don't cry. Like it's, it's, like I said, the hardest thing to know when you're a new programmer is like what's been done before, you know, like nobody here knew that there was a min element function. Now, you know, and now you can use it, right? None of you knew there was an accumulate function. Now, you know, now you can use it. Okay. And so, uh, sort, you know, I told you like pointed you like there's a sort function. And so some of you guys, uh, found that, but, uh, yeah, the other ones, this is this is actually what separates experienced programmers from new programmers. New programmers sit there and go like, okay, I'm going to take the smallest number, and if I find somebody smaller than it, then the smallest guy is now this guy. I'll do the same for the biggest. If I find somebody bigger than my biggest guy, the biggest guy is now this guy. You can do all that. It's fine. It's a good it's a good coding exercise. It's good for you. Um, but experienced programmers are like, I'll just call min element. I'll just call max element. <laughs> Move on with your life. You know what I mean? And this is one of the reasons why, you know, they'll, they'll say that some programmers are like an order of magnitude more productive than other ones. It's, it's not because they're more intelligent or anything. It's just if you just know, like, oh, this is a problem that's been solved before. You know, you don't have to sit there and get out a piece of scratch paper and like work it out. If there's a function, you just call the function done. Or if it's something uh, like a famous algorithm, like shortest path or something like that, then you're just like, oh, I'll just use Dijkstra's or whatever, you know. And, you know, uh, maybe you go online and find a Dijkstra's implementation or you write it yourself either way. But when you know, when you know what the solution is, it's a lot easier. You know, it's something that my, uh, my math professors never seem to understand. <laughs> they would write it, they would write a final and be like, well, it only took me 20 minutes to do it. It's like, yeah, it's cause you know the answer already. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, it's easy when you know the answer. And that, and that's one of the things that I try to, um, teach you guys in this class is, you know, what's out there, what, what's been done. And then when you go and write code yourself, you can just leverage all that existing stuff instead of reinventing the wheel from scratch every time. So that's it from for today. Hope you guys had fun. Vectors are extremely useful. They're extremely, extremely useful. These are the most common used data structure in the world. Um, hash tables are maybe faster at some things, but um, vectors are like the vanilla ice cream. They're just everywhere. You got to know them. They're extremely, extremely useful. So we will practice more on Wednesday, but that's it for today. See you guys next time. Peace.